Hello, everyone, and welcome to another installment of the Esri GeoDev webinar series. About three years ago, we started this series as a way to continue engaging in developer-related topics and discussions in between Dev Summits. We have a lot of new topics, advanced features, and additional functionality to share with you over the coming months, so be sure to stay connected with us through our GeoDev webinar series page on go.esri.com slash geodev or any of our social media accounts at Esri GeoDev. We would love to have conversations like these taking place throughout the year so that when we do meet at one of our Dev Summit conferences, it will be as though we never stopped. We hope you get as much or more out of this webinar than you anticipated. Now we would like to introduce you to today's webinar, Intro to the ArcGIS Maps SDK for Game Engines. Before we get started, we'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. You're listening in using your computer's speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select Use Telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A portion at the end of today's presentation. I would now like to introduce one of our presenters today, Rex Hansen. Rex, let's get started, shall we? Great, thanks, Amy. And welcome to our webinar, introducing the first beta release of the ArcGIS Maps SDK for game engines. First, just a little background on who we are. My name is Rex Hansen. I'm the product manager for the ArcGIS Maps SDK, and I'll be joined by Adrian Mario, the development lead for the ArcGIS Maps SDK. We both work for Esri, the global leader in professional GIS software solution, uh, services and solutions based in Redlands, California. Both Adrian and I work out of the Redlands, California location. Before we dig into capabilities and technologies of the Maps SDK, I'd like to provide a brief overview of how we got here and why what we're doing is important. Over the past few years, we've seen a number of industries, enterprises, and businesses pursue their next generation of 3D GIS solutions. As these solutions apply to the real world, they need to leverage existing authoritative geospatial systems while taking advantage of new technologies to gather, store, and distribute geospatial information. Of course, Esri, as the global leader in this space, has provided and continues to deliver the systems to manage maintain and utilize geospatial data, and is at the forefront of defining new standards and technology to efficiently gather, curate, and deliver high-fidelity geospatial information. These new 3D GIS solutions include client applications that target specific workflows that require photorealistic experiences powered by real-world data. They need to take advantage of high-end graphics capabilities on modern devices and utilize hardware designed specifically to support extended reality experiences like headsets to power AR and VR workflows. These applications need to be highly interactive, responsive, and intuitive. They need to be designed to be visually compelling, immersive, and as realistic as possible to increase engagement, improve understanding, and optimize the environment for making decisions. Operationally, they need to support modeling and evaluation of phenomenon in the real world simulating natural and human-oriented activities and the interaction between them in the past, present, and the future. In addition, they need to quickly render dynamic, real-time geospatial content accessible in the office and in the field for rapid analysis and decision-making purposes. Now, a number of industries have already embarked on this effort, and they're pursuing targeted solutions founded on game technology. Now, this is more than just gamification of GIS solutions, which is basically the use of game style interaction patterns to drive and empower users of software. It's the use of game engines, game engine technology to build the next generation of 3D GIS clients and experiences on new devices with new expectations. These industries and solutions include AEC for urban planning or commissioning of new construction or evaluating work sites in the field, and defense and public safety for collaboration, <clears throat> battle and situation planning, real-time monitoring, awareness and threat detection, and the immersive yet cost-effective training. In natural resources to manage oil, gas pipelines, and facilities, planning mining efforts and monitor infrastructure. In utilities to model resource flows, evaluate impact, and visualize and manage assets in the field. In transportation to capture and manage geospatial assets, plan for new infrastructure and model vehicle movement. And of course, in education to help drive a greater understanding of the world around us 
by delivering engaging experiences to do things like explore the eye of a hurricane or visualize potential impacts of climate change. So there's other client technology out there in the web and the native space to build out 3D clients, 3D GIS solutions. Why game engines? Well, as game engines have targeted gaming experiences, it was essential that they deliver high performance premium, render, premium rendering of content with fast and fluid interactions to meet and compete in the gaming space. The highly competitive nature of the gaming industry helped push game technology and associated content and hardware to the limits of their abilities. As such, years of development have been invested by successful game engine vendors to build out premium, high definition rendering pipelines to deliver simulated world experiences optimized for multiple platforms and form factors. Of course, to build a more immersive and compelling experience, game engines also invested heavily in systems and APIs to simulate the real-time interaction and movement of real life. The introduction of high fidelity assets, physics engines, animation properties, atmospheric water and other special effects has enabled some game engines to deliver beautiful, photorealistic cutting edge visual visuals that appear and operate nearly identical to the real world. Game engines also support, uh, also provide support for targeting a wide variety of desktop and mobile platforms and dedicated specialized hardware. Part of the next generation of 3D, 3D GIS solutions include business use of headsets dedicated to extended reality workflows, such as HoloLens, Oculus Quest and Rift, and HTC Vive. Game engines are built to support the responsiveness, frame rates, and fidelity needed to power these experiences. And last but certainly not least, successful game engine vendors have existing developer programs and communities, help doc, forums, and tutorials and the talented individuals and organizations that know the technology and are available to do the work. With that in mind, we at Esri are delivering the ArcGIS Maps SDK as a developer product that integrates with the two market leading game engines, Unity and Epic's Unreal Engine. The ArcGIS Maps SDK for Unity and the ArcGIS Maps SDK for Unreal Engine will be distributed as plugins and provide APIs to access ArcGIS services and local data. This work will be founded on support for local and global 3D experiences through a scene, which, is provided, which provides the context to display and interact with geospatial data and honor real world geographic coordinate space. And of course, these products will include world-class SDK resources as is expected from Esri's developer products. So that's the high level view of these new developer products. Now let's transition to a more practical discussion on what our first beta release will contain and support. To reiterate, the first beta release will consist of two products or plugins, the ArcGIS Maps SDK for Unity and the ArcGIS Maps SDK for Unreal Engine. The Unity plugin will support the latest version of Unity, 2020.1, but should work with newer versions. The Unreal Engine plugin will support Unreal Engine 4.24.3, but should also work with newer versions as well. The products will consist of two parts, the plugins and the documentation. The plugins will be available for download from the beta program on Esri's early adopter site. If you haven't joined the beta program yet, use this link to register. We'll make this link available at the end of this webinar as well. And the documentation, which includes the guide doc, the API ref, and samples, will be available on the ArcGIS for Developers site. A link to the documentation will be provided from the beta program. Next, let's spend some time covering the capabilities of the MAPS SDKs to set expectations for this first public beta. Keep in mind, functionality delivered in the MAPS SDKs for Unity and Unreal Engine is equal, while functionality and capabilities of the editors and the engines themselves may be different. Development in the Unity or Unreal Editor will be supported on Windows and Mac OS. And although Unity and Unreal Engine support developing apps for a variety of platforms, with the first Maps SDK beta, you'll only be able to build apps that target Windows, Mac OS, Android, and iOS. It's important to note that support for Windows includes 64-bit apps on desktops and 32 and 64-bit UWP apps, which means will support use on the first and second generation of HoloLens. Both local flat earth experiences and global round earth experiences are available. Local supports display of geographic data on a planar surface and can work with different projected coordinate systems, usually appropriate for smaller local areas. Global supports the display of geographic data on a sphere or globe, usually appropriate for large areas or regions. Data sources accessible by the plugins include a single elevation service for terrain. 
This means an image service hosting lurk encoded tiles with elevation values. This includes ArcGIS Online world elevation services for terrain and bathymetry. Also, we'll support multiple raster tile layers, which include cached map or image data for display from a service or a local tile package or TPK. Sources include ArcGIS Online base maps with imagery, topography, or street data. To add to that, we'll support multiple 3D object or integrated uh, mesh scene layers. These layers are founded on I3S, an open specification optimized for the, the delivery and the use of 3D data. 3D objects can include textured buildings and structures, while integrated mesh uses a triangular network to represent a continuous 3D surface, usually acquired by satellite or aerial imagery. They can be delivered as scene services or local scene layer packages, SLPKs. It's important to note that scene layers must be published with version 1.7 of I3S, the latest version, to use the MAPS SDKs. Version 1.7 includes significant improvements to performance and memory usage, so we're encouraging its use as the minimum version with the new MAPS SDKs. Note that the first beta release will only support access to public ArcGIS services, not secured services, or services that require authentication. We'll add support to enable access to secured services in the next beta release. It's also important to note that we will not support built-in access to feature services, such as ArcGIS feature services or mobile geo databases in this first beta. We will target support in a future release though. However, starting in this first beta, we will provide a location component to integrate custom content, game objects, and actors within the scene established by the ArcGIS plugin. So as a developer, you can use this location component and craft a solution that retrieves or creates feature geometry and attributes to display and use in a scene. In fact, you can use the location component to bring in a wide variety of geospatial content to participate within the scene. The Maps SDKs also deliver a couple of options for working with the plugins. Both will include a UI to configure properties of the scene, set camera position and mod add modified layers. Both will include an API for developers to deliver a solution code. We'll also integrate with Unreal Engine Blueprints, a visual scripting system. Out of the box, we'll support keyboard and mouse interactions with the scene. Of course, as developers, you can build other means for interactions, such as touch or hand gestures, depending upon the devices you intend to target. Control of the camera will involve setting an initial viewpoint, but also changing that viewpoint explicitly in code. And layer change events will enable you to listen for events, such as when a layer was added or removed, or a property changed, such as visibility. And with that, I'd like to hand off to Adrian to show a few demos of the ArcGIS Maps SDK in action and discuss the underlying framework. Adrian? Thank you, Rex. So yeah, I'm gonna bring you on a tour of exactly what you'd be able to do once you download the ArcGIS uh, Maps SDK for Unity and for Unreal. Great, I can see your screen. Perfect. So once you download the SDK, you will have two uh, folder. One with Unity, we will contain the Unity package where everything is included in there. And for Unreal, you will have a zip file. And if you unzip, you have a folder with a U uh, plugin in it. So let's start with Unity. So if you're not familiar with Unity, uh, the best way to start is a Unity Hub. This is where you can you know, manage your project and your install, uh, Unity install, because you can have, as I have here, several installs of Unity on the same machine. Once again, we recommend to use 2020.1 uh, for the beta, as this is the one that we've been uh, testing on, uh, but newer version uh, should work also. So the thing you will have to do is start by creating a new project. In Unity, it's noticeable that you have basically three different rendering pipelines. You have the legacy rendering pipeline, the 2D and 3D here. Those one will not be supported uh, by the beta plugin. Instead, uh, we're supporting both the high rendering, uh, high definition rendering pipeline, which is really targeted for high-end graphic uh, application, like AAA games and the universal rendering pipeline. And the universal rendering pipeline is more for the wide platform uh, support. So I will create an application here, but it takes a little bit of time. So instead, actually start at that new project already created here. So this one is the HDRP project, so high, de uh, high definition rendering pipeline project. And this is what you end up with once you create your project. You end up with a sample scene that you can already run. So 
let's run so you can uh, get a little bit familiar with the Unity uh, Unity uh, framework so we can all be in the same page. On the window on the right, which is basically your main window, the game window, is what your game will look like. And you can see that even with just that sample that was included when I created that project, I can already interact with the scene exactly like if I was uh, interacting inside the game. The window on the left is the scene, uh, the scene, uh, the scene window. It's kind of the behind the scene representation on how the app is built. I call it the kind of the movie director point of view. So what I want you to do is pay attention to the camera while I'm moving around inside the application. You can see that on the right window in the game window, I'm you know interacting exactly like if I was running the app. And on the left, you can see that the scene is constructed by not having the data move at all. The data is static. And you just have the camera moving around the scene. This is only possible because uh, the scene is small enough. The problem is when we took with the data that is too big in size, we hit the precision issue in both game engine Unity and Unreal. And obviously, the ArcGIS Maps SDK for game engines needs to represent the entire world. So this won't work as is. So I will show you what the solution is and, and the adaptation that you will have to have to your current project uh, to be able to integrate. So before extending on this, let's see how I can import uh, the plugin inside my new HDRP uh, project. So for this, I'll go to Assets import package and importing a custom package. I link to the Unity package that I just uh, showed you earlier and click open. Takes a little bit uh, to actually gather all the uh, plugins data that needs to be included. And then uh, it gives you a list of exactly everything that is included. So you have a lot of you know scripts and things that you can modify yourself, which mean you know we're in the game engine and for game engine developers are really used to be able to access even the UI source code and be able to modify it uh, as much as you want. Then uh, we were talking about mobile support uh, when Rex was mentioning all the platform we support, and you can see the list here. So for Android, we do support ARM64, so ARM V8 and ARM V7. Uh, for iOS, we support ARM64 and the Simulator 64 version. For macOS, we'll support 64-bit, uh, same for Windows. And finally, UWP. I uh, just wanted to precise that UWP is right now only included for Unity, and, uh, and that will include ARM64, which will be HoloLens 2, uh, the X64 and X86. X86 will be HoloLens 1. We're waiting to implement the UWP support inside uh, Unreal Engine when the Unreal Engine has a more mature uh, implementation of the U UWP, uh, UWP build. So once you import your package, you just click Import, and that will bring the package inside your Solution Explorer, which is what you have uh, on the on the bottom uh, left here. So waiting it to load. Should be done quickly. Up. Oh, here it is. So now I have this folder uh, that is structured with all the components and things that you can look at on how we build the UI, how we build the API, and things like that if you want to modify it for your, uh, for your uh, specific needs. And it's all written exactly in a game engine natural way, uh, so you can modify the scripts. We have prefabs, and I'm going to go a little bit uh, over that when using uh, samples. But prefabs is a way where you can actually interact with the ArcGIS Maps SDK uh, using the UI. But the simplest way uh, to first uh, have an interaction with uh, the ArcGIS Maps SDK is to load the samples. So we have two types of samples, the API scene, where you will set your scene using code, and then the prefab scene, where you will use your um, We'll use the UI to, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, we'll use the UI to set up your scene. So let's start with the API. So I'm just double clicking and then I have actually a scene. So I can definitely uh, directly load 
uh, the sample in there. And now you can see on the top uh, left that uh, the, the scene changed from what it was before. And the only new game objects I have here is the ArcGIS map. So the ArcGIS map is set up and to know how uh, the details of that particular game object, we move to the right into the inspector window. And then you can see that the only stuff he has is a script. And the script, I can just open the script by double clicking and then look at the source code that enable uh, that sample to run. So the first thing you do is you set up your view modes. So as Rex mentioned, we support the global view where all the data is draped on the globe, on the sphere. And then uh, we do support local also where it is kind of the flat earth experience. Uh, and then we have a base map. So if you want to know what the base map is, you can actually go uh, to the URL and then see uh, what it looks like. And the base map has a world transportation layer included and there's the world imagery especially. That means we'll see the imagery of the entire world uh, using, this, uh, using this service. If you want to find your own data to add uh, to, the, to the scene, you can find a lot of data inside the Living Atlas at livingatlas.rgs.com and type you know, any, uh, any city or anything you might be interested in and then have access to a lot of different content that you could add to your application. So let's go back to our source code. And uh, in, in addition to the base map layer, we have an elevation service. And this is the world elevation service that Rex just mentioned, to be able to drape the imagery on top of a surface that represents the elevation for the entire world. And then we have a set of data that is a set of layers that is specific to New York. We have the uh, transit frequency, we have the industrial zoning, we have the population density, and then we have the untextured building. And this is a version 1.7 of 3D uh, objects scene layer that uh, Rex mentioned earlier. The next step we will need, uh, we don't need to set uh, the local because that's not what we're using in this sample. Uh, but the next step we will need to set is the position of the camera. And that's what we do here. I will go back to the component a little bit later, which is the end of that file uh, to explain how it works. And that's pretty much it. And that's using the API. Now, you know, I haven't done any changes and let's see what it looks like. I'm just running play after loading the sample. And now you will be able to see in the game loading all the data we just so define. And I do have a weird artifact here. Let me restart that because it shouldn't be blue. Here it is. So you can see the data is loading. Um, and I can navigate to the scene using the mouse. I can interact rotating around. I can use a keyboard for a more smooth uh, experience. I can go through the scene and you know really navigate and look around. What I want to do is have a quick look of behind the scene. So once again, I'm taking the you know the uh, I call it the movie director view of it. Uh, that will be the view on the left. So what the user is seeing and interact is, is uh, the view on the right. And you'll see that when the user is looking at data on the right, you can see what happened to the data that is not in the view anymore. We have different LOD represented here, and you can see some uh, very basic LOD loading, and you can see that most of the building gets unloaded. So we are really dealing with memory management to make sure that you only load the memory that you need to represent the scene with your current viewpoint. This is absolutely necessary when your data can be for the entire world and you can move from one, one side of the world to the other at any point. Uh, so we really connect to the service and load the LOD and unload the LOD uh, as it goes. And you see, if I don't see, uh, don't look anywhere close, you get some really basic LOD uh, representation. So that way when I go back, um, I will have some data. The second thing I want to talk about, and this is coming back to the previous sample where I show you where the data was fixed and the camera was moving around. And I was explaining that it's not possible when you represent the entire world. And it's that now if I pan, you see that even in, like, in the scene windows, it's kind of the movie director window, 
the data is moving to the camera. It's not the camera that's moving around. So it's a complete change of behavior uh, for a typical game engine application. And it's really important to, uh, to understand that distinction because that will mean that by default, uh, you will have to do some extra work to integrate your data inside the scene. So the main question you might have now is how can I connect my existing game engine objects or my actors in, uh, in Unreal? Because I'm showing that in Unity, but it works exactly the same way in, in Unreal Engine. So I can connect my existing uh, uh, game objects or actors uh, to actually you know, participate into the scene. So I'm going to show you uh, how to do this. To represent the, you know, the data that you might already have, I'm going to create quickly a game object. I'm going to choose a sphere, for example. But this uh, game object could be anything. It could be one of the buildings you have. It could be the skies. It could be some smoke effect that you have. It could be anything. Uh, and uh, they, just, uh, they would just be a game object inside the framework. So what you will have to do is go back in the inspector window and add a component to it. So the component is going to be called ArcGIS location uh, component, but it's still, uh, as you can see, not totally ready to uh, release. We need a, a name change in there. And what that component is asking is some latitude, longitude, and attitude uh, position to be able to take the anchor of your uh, game uh, component that you have here to be able to place it in the scene. So you have here some coordinate from the Governor Islands, uh, just outside of uh, Downtown, uh, just outside of New York. And so I'm going to position my sphere in there. So that's all I did to my sphere in as that component. I'm going to make my sphere bigger to make sure that we can see it uh, from far away. So 100 meters should do. And now I press play. And now you should be able to see that the sphere I created uh, is part of my scene. It's moving with my scene. And it's even participating into the scene where you can see the shadow of my sphere is actually caught up on the surface of my ArcGIS components. So this is how you can really incorporate your own data into uh, the data that's provided by the ArcGIS Maps SDK. To make sure it's really the scene, what we can do is uh, select the sphere and maybe change its shape. Uh, let's try to make it look like a rugby ball. It is, that's a pretty gigantic rugby ball. But you can definitely see that uh, it's really just my game object and it's totally integrated with, um, with my uh, ArcGIS Maps SDK uh, data and it's moving and interacting as if it was part of the same scene. The other samples that we provide uh, is the uh, prefab scene, which is basically providing the UI uh, scene. So you can you can open the sample, and all you can see is that the same thing. I still have a camera, light, and the sky. And the only way, the only things I have coming from specifically the ArcGIS Maps SDK plugin uh, is this uh, is this prefab. And the prefab. I can just look at the inspector again, and then I can set up the scene just using uh, just using a simple UI. And you can see exactly the same thing we saw in the code earlier. Uh, we have the initial camera here. We have global or local scene, and then we can change our base map, and then we have a list of layers, and we can add layers from either URL or from a file. But I'm going to show how to use the UI inside Unreal because I want to make sure I spend as much time on Unity as I do uh, on Unreal. So let's close this for now and let's let's move to the Unreal uh, engine this time. So really similar to uh, Unity, you can uh, the first step into into Unreal will be using the Epic Game Launcher, and the same here you could have actually several install of uh, Unreal. So you see I have two install of Unreal here on my machine. Uh, we do recommend that you use the 425 because that's the version that we've been uh, developing and testing on, uh, but newer version uh, should work. And, uh, 
and yeah so let's actually let's start uh, let's start this by creating a new uh, by launching the unreal engine 4.25 and then is going to launch an interface allowing me to start uh, to create a new application. Oh yeah, I do have some StVR connection because Unreal Engine is connected to my VR environment. So uh, when creating a new project in uh, in Unreal, you don't have the choice, uh, the same choices that you had in uh, in Unity. So you can select, you know, one of the experience that you want to build for. So let's say you want to build a game. And then you can start with some kind of template to help you, or you can start with a blank project. And then you have a choice of uh, different, uh, uh, different way you're going to interact and, and create your own project. And this is where I want to introduce blueprints. So uh, in Unreal, you have the same capability as Unity where you can develop using pure source code or using the UI. But you also have the adi uh, additional functionality of be able to use Blueprint. Blueprint is kind of a code generator uh, where basically by you know, basically moving boxes around and leaking them and changing some properties, uh, you can press play and you build your code uh, just by using those blueprints, uh, blueprints element. So once again, I'm not going to create the project here because it takes a little bit. Uh, instead, I'm going to go to uh, projects that already created, and this time we're going to go. We're going to show some uh, ways of uh, including the pro as a plugin uh, using more source code approach. So I right click on the Epic Launcher to load the empty projects that I uh, previously created. And the way to include the plugins, I can create a folder and call it plugins. And then I'm going to grab uh, the plugins that uh, I just downloaded. So you will have to unzip uh, the ArcGIS Maps SDK plugin for Unreal Engine and copy the folder uh, into that plugin folder. So this will copy the entire data, and once again, it's pretty big because we support all the uh, different platform, Android, uh, iOS, macOS, Windows. Uh, so it is a lot of bits that needs to be uh, that needs to be copied over. And when it's copied, you can actually go to your uh, project and generate the Visual Studio project file again. That will include this time uh, the plugin folder. So it will update uh, the solution. Uh, by including access to every um, source code that is available in the plugin. That takes it a bit. Let's open now the solution. And here it is. And you can see now in my uh, solution, I should have opened it before to show you that you didn't add the plugin folder inside uh, Visual Studio. So now all I can do is Control F5 to get that running, and you'll see that we're building. And what it needs to build in is to build um, the uh, plugin that we just copied over. So uh, in uh, in Unreal, when you build, you actually build the entire Unreal Engine, and that's the first folder you can see. And then you have your project. Uh, on the right, and then with different source code there. Because the project was bu was uh, built before, what Unreal needs to build now is mostly uh, the plugin that we just added. So you can actually see that we have a DLL, which is basically uh, where the rendering uh, is happening. And then we have a bunch of uh, source files that you can access and have a look at on how we build the samples, how we build blueprints, uh, and now we build basically the, the rest of the plugin. And we're almost going to get there. So it's right now building, the, uh, building our samples. It was way faster than I tested it earlier. Maybe I should have uh, restarted my computer in between. Here it is. So when it's done building, it's actually loading uh, Unreal for us. And uh, we should be able to see uh, to look at our to look at our plugin. 
So uh, first thing to see, the interface is pretty, is really similar. So that's basically the equivalent of your game window. Uh, and then you have all your uh, current actors uh, on the top right, and then you can access property by selecting an actor. What you could do right away is access uh, by selecting the choose the path, access or uh, access uh, maps SDK plugin here. Notice that you might not see the plugin content here is because you need to go on the bottom right of the content browser and in the view option, uh, you need to make sure that you select uh, show plugin content right here. So that needs to be enabled for you to be able to see uh, the plugin content. So I'm going to open the map SDK content and the same thing that we had in uh, in Unity, you had access to our material or texture and, and our source code if you need to, but the best way to start is really just looking at the samples. So I'm going to start with the first sample. So we have three samples, as I mentioned in Unreal, you have three of interacting with the data, you, we, creating your scene basically, you can have a blueprint, uh, you can have pure C++ code, or you can have the map uh, controller which will be uh, using the UI. So it might be the first time for a lot of you that you're looking at blueprints. So let me show you uh, what it looks like. So for this, I go to blueprint and open level blueprint. And that opens the scene that I've created, that has created part of the sample inside Blueprint. So even if you don't understand uh, that type of scripting language, uh, it was really easy to see that we have exactly the same structure that we had in the code in Unity that I showed in the UI in Unity that I showed. You have the map, and then you need to select if you want a global or local experience. Then we have the base, uh, the base maps. That's exactly the same base map we had in the UI in Unity and in the C++ in the C sharp code in Unity. Then we have the elevation layer, and then we have the three different layers uh, that are added. So uh, the one was a, a transit frequency, and then the initial zoning of New York, and the last one was the untextual building from 3D Object version 1.7. Uh, that were also in uh, in Unity. So that was just a quick look at what Blueprint looks like. But once you load your samples, all you have to do is press play, and you will see that you have exactly the same experience we had in Unity, uh, this time uh, running in Unreal. And same thing, I can use the mouse to move around. I can use the keyboard for more smoother uh, interactions. And really data is loaded and unloaded depending on my camera position. And you can see the, the light interacting with the faces of, uh, of the city. So if I get out of there, I can stop uh, the blueprint sample. I can show you quickly what the uh, C++ sample look like. And once again, it's really similar experience uh, as we had in, uh, in Unity. So I can actually look at what uh, the sample look like by loading uh, the uh, map creator here. Oop. So I'm going to right click here and say open uh, the header file. And from the header files, I will go to the definition of that function. And now I go to the uh, to actually code. So obviously, we're in Unreal now, uh, Unreal Engine. So it's uh, C++ code. So we have header files and CPP files. And the CPP files is looking pretty much exactly uh, the conversion between .NET to C++ to the one we just saw earlier. So I'm going to go ahead to it quickly. We have a map. You select global or local. And then we have a base map, we have elevation, uh, we have the same layers that were set either in blueprints uh, or uh, by code or UI in Unreal Engine, in Unity. And then we have the same uh, New York data of untextual buildings. So basically exactly the same scene, but this time uh, set up using C++ code. So if I press play, uh, you will have exactly the same experience that I had when, uh, when running uh, inside uh, uh, running with blueprints. Okay, and so the last thing we're going to look at, look at, look at, sorry, um, is actually using the UI. So the third sample is a map controller samples. I'm not going to save any changes. And same experience, you can actually select the actor, and then in a detailed panel, uh, get uh, get an ID 
uh, of um, uh, of what the data looks like and actually set up your scene uh, using UI. So you can see exactly the same parameters that we had before. We have the camera location, uh, we have a base map, uh, we have, you know, do you want to add data with the URL or do you want to add it from files? And then we have the list of layers where I can change, you know, visibility and, and other, uh, the order of the buildings and, and things like that. Actually, what I'm going to do is uh, add the Montreal data, and this one is a textual building this time. So I'm going to add this. I'm going to add that layer and press play. So by default, you will have exactly the same experience as before, uh, where you just have uh, New York. And actually, now I'm going to show you that, you know, what I was saying that uh, we work for the entire world. Well, I can zoom out. Don't mind the smog effect that we might uh, work on. And then I can really see that it's a global view of the world and um, and see uh, and see the entire world. So now I'm going to try to see if I can find Montreal quickly. I think it's right there. Good. I have a friend living there, so he'll be happy that I was able to find it from space. Uh, and now I have the data of Montreal uh, loading, still loading. My internet connection is not the greatest, but that's actually showing you that we have LOD that is streamed uh, from ArcGIS Online directly into your game engine. And you can really go anywhere you want. The last thing I wanted to show is the ability of going to a more local scene. So once again, so I'm going to use the UI, select my map controller. I'm going to use exactly the same uh, experience, except that this time, I'm going to go from global and select a local scene. I'll press play again. And then once again, oops, oops, some problem there. Uh, zoom away. And then you'll see that now, you know, if you build it in flat earth, here is your proof. And then you have uh, really a plan world. But obviously, you know, we still have elevation data for the entire world. So you can zoom everywhere you want. If you have a better internet connection, you have the LOD streaming faster than mine, and then you'll be able to, you know, implement a Zoom uh, and have a pretty good uh, flight simulator experience just by adding the imagery layer and the elevation layer. So that's it for a quick tour of, um, you know, the five different ways you can interact with our plugins. So we showed the code in Unity. Uh, we show the UI in Unity, and then we show Blueprint, Code, and UI in uh, in Unreal Engine. So what I want to show you now, I'm going to give back uh, control to Rex so he can share his slides. <clears throat> and then, yeah, I can see your computer, okay. Rex. So, because my, why now you might have a question is that there are so many ways to interact uh, with the plugins. What is the best way? What are the limitations in terms of uh, capability I will have by interacting with the plugin? Um, because so we have the UI uh, option that is valuable in Unity and Unreal Engine. We have the code in Unity and Unreal Engine. And then we have the Blueprint option for Unreal Engine. So, this is the list you can see on the right of, uh, of, this, uh, of this diagram. And this diagram is really to show you that, first of all, everything in blue is open source. I'm talking about the Unreal UI and the Unity UI. So that's mean that if you feel like you want to expand uh, what the UI is like, and you want to be able to add functionalities that are specific to your workflow, you have access to the API that is right underneath to be able to expose those uh, capabilities through the UI. And same thing with Blueprints. And the U API that is underneath all of that uh, is auto-generated, which means not only you will have the same functionality in coding, in blueprints, and that are exposed to you uh, to be used in UI, but it's also the same functionality in uh, Unreal Engine as it is in Unity. Everything is auto-generated, so at the end, you end up with an API that is in functionality exactly the same, uh, obviously, it's different because uh, you have a C++ API for Unreal Engine, and then you have a C Sharp API for Unity. So it's we really look native for those two different uh, programming language. But in terms of functionality, those are exactly the same. So the choice of what you want to use in terms of UI, Blueprint, API, or in terms of Game Engine, 
are really based on your own workflow and depending on the development team you have in terms of experience that you have or what type of application you want to build. But know that by using the plugin in any of those engines, you will have access to all the same functionality in any of those interactions. And that's uh, all I add. Back to you, Rex. <coughs> Great, thanks, Adrian. Uh, great, great rundown, great technical rundown of some of the capabilities in our first beta release. Uh, so, question: So, what's our current timeline for delivery of this first beta release for the Maps SDKs for Unity and Unreal Engine? We're currently targeting the first beta release in about two weeks, so you should get uh, deliverables in about two weeks through our beta program. Uh, now, to get access to these products, you'll need to join the beta program using the link provided here. Uh, anyone who's a member of this beta program will be notified when the first beta is available. Uh, also keep in mind that any of the feedback on these beta products or any questions on our developer efforts with game engines can be handled in this beta program's uh, user forums, which are open and available today. Uh, feel free to ask any questions, share details about use cases that you have or that you'd like to target and discuss. Uh, when the beta product is released, uh, you can also submit bugs or enhancement requests and we'll assess as well. And I believe with that, we'll be taking a few questions. Uh, back to you, Amy. All right, thank you so much, Rex. Um, we're gonna now begin answering the questions submitted during today's presentation. We've received quite a few and we will try to get through as many as possible, but whatever we do not get to today, we will address in a GeoNet blog post after this webinar. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. So the first question is, will there be support for WebGL in Unity? Uh, at this stage, at this stage, we uh, we don't have plans uh, to support WebGL at this stage, uh, but of course we're looking at uh, different opportunities and different use cases that might uh, that might allow us to maybe entertain those, uh, entertain uh, that that opportunity in the future. Uh, but there's no current plans to do that. All right, thanks, Rex. Is there a way of how to use C Sharp with Unreal Engine four? Adrian, I. Don't think so, but you know, at the end, it's just going to have some interrupt code. Uh, you know, with C sharp DLLs that actually hit C plus plus C code. Uh, but I'm not uh, too familiar with capabilities from uh, Unreal Engine to be able to use C sharp code in there. There do is uh, a push to be able to support UWP to be able to um, actually. Um, release your uh, your apps into a hololens uh, one uh, one and two but i think that's like more uh, a rebuild of uwp i don't think that's actually enabling c sharp code in uh, in unreal engine but i will have to i will have to check on that all right thanks can i use lidar data as a source for building this 3d data Yes, actually. So there's there's a number of different ways that you can bring in uh, LiDAR data uh, into game engines. Uh, of course, uh, being able to work with LiDAR data within the within the ArcGIS platform usually means uh, curating or basically publishing that data in an I3S format that supports point cloud uh, information. And so currently we don't support access, direct access to point cloud uh, scene layers or scene services um, or SLPKs, but we will be supporting this in the future, actually. So this first release with respect to I3S or 3D content, uh, scene layers specifically, will be supporting 3D object and integrated mesh. Uh, we continue to uh, we continue to uh, pursue efforts to advance that support for other types of I3S data formats. All right, thanks. This seems to all apply to native apps in ArcGIS runtime. What support is there for web developers? So it's uh, not not really ArcGIS runtime uh, here. So ArcGIS runtime is still a uh, it's a separate product stack, a separate family of, of SDKs that targets native development. Uh, the ArcGIS Maps SDKs is different. Uh, this is different in the sense that uh, obviously we're working with game engine technology, and the architecture of the Maps SDKs is different from runtime. In this, in basically, in the sense that uh, being able to access data is similar, but being able to and rendering that data is different. So within the runtime SDKs, uh, we're responsible for implementing um, the rendering capabilities on top of standard rendering engines, rendering platforms. Within the game engine SDKs, we hand off that data. We provide that data to the game engines for rendering. So the game engines themselves are responsible for rendering the data, which also at the same time gives you as developers access uh, to that, that information, such as the meshes that are available to 
a game engine to be rendered. So the architecture is different, actually. There are different uh, product families. Um, there, at this stage, we're really focused on, on providing really native developers with access to uh, native capabilities within game engine within uh, game engines that that we uh, that, that we're supporting today, Unity and Unreal Engine. We of course are are looking at, at uh, maybe opportunities in those game engine spaces to be able to target um, what what of what's available uh, for web developers. But right now at this stage, we're looking at native application developers and native support, uh, and native platform support. Of course, we're always, as I mentioned before, uh, we're we're always interested in entertaining uh, maybe use cases and workflows uh, going forward. But keep in mind that the ArcGIS Runtime SDKs and the ArcGIS Maps SDKs uh, are really two different families, two different product families. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Is HP Reverb supported for Game Engine SDK? I don't even know what HP Reverb is. <laughs> you're, talking, you're talking about the uh, the target platform for this? Uh, now, uh, I think one thing, they didn't I, specify. Yeah, so I keep, the one thing to keep in mind here too is that you know we're providing really uh, the ability to access ArcGIS uh, services, ArcGIS data, actually from within game engines. And so we're basically supplementing other capabilities that the game engines themselves support. So, for example, if you're looking at being able to target specific platforms, like you know being able to deploy to uh, VR headsets or AR headsets, of course we need to be able to support the platform, the operating system that. Uh, that those that those headsets or those plat that those target uh, devices support, but keep in mind that we're we're just integrating within a, an existing developer environment, right? So uh, if you're able to work with or at least access or enable access to different capabilities that the game engine provides, that a game engine provides, whether it's Unity or Unreal Engine, we're really supplementing that by enabling access to ArcGIS service. We're not reinventing uh, how that works, actually. I'm looking at it right now, and I think. Uh... HP River built. Basically, we do support any you know uh, hardware that fall in the category of you know the Windows XT4, the yep. ARM V8, ARM V7, uh, iOS one, macOS, but that's not the HP Reverb and the uh, UWP ones. Uh, so I do feel like that will be covered. Uh, the only thing you will have to do, uh, we don't have any components that will allow you uh, to connect any VR or AR devices directly. Uh, with the plugin, which means you will have to write uh, your own, you know, uh, camera controller directly from uh, the device and read the, the, uh, the position of the device and send that uh, to the game engine in something that we are planning on having in the future uh, that is not really for better. But uh, this is where having, um, uh, this is where having, uh, I'm actually uh, some uh, engineer just wrote to me that uh, yeah, HP Reverb for Unity for Unreal Engine 4 is no problem, uh, <laughs> so it should be the same with Unity. Uh, but uh, so uh, having a community part of the beta uh, early adopter website is you know if you get some kind of VR devices working, which means you just need the code to connect. Uh, the controller and all the sensors from your device to the camera of the ArcGIS Maps SDK. Uh, please share it with the community, and you know we can improve on that, and then hopefully release part of final uh, some scripts that will allow uh, other users to connect their VR devices uh, really easily. But in terms of uh, targeting. Uh, that particular headset, uh, that should be fine. Uh, it's more about uh, the, the little bit of work that you will have to do to connect the VR and get a full VR experience. All right, thank you so much. Um, is it possible to use geo-referenced augmented reality anchors with the SDK? So the same way we just show uh, how you can add a component and then uh, uh, be able to give, you know, um, lat long uh, altitude and even the rotation uh, matrix to it. Uh, you'll be able to do that with any you know keys that you load. It could be from AirCore, it could be from uh, ARKit. They all have the different uh, system of uh, saving a special uh, special key. You will get. We need to extract from that uh, from that reference the global positioning of it, and that might be uh, the biggest effort to do is to be able to load. Uh, to have a link between your AR uh, 
spatial anchor, which usually are in local space, and you need to extract a global positioning from it. But once you have that, by using the location component that I show by adding the sphere on top of the governor's island, by using that exact functionality, yes, it will work. All right, thanks, Adrian. Can we set the component at the root of an asset, or do you need to do it for each of the elements in the asset? I think why now it needs to be done for each asset. Uh, I can take that comment uh, back to the dev team and see if we can enable, be able to have a, a group of them. But I will guess you could get one game object uh, that is the um, yeah the father of them and set the component on this one and then all the one on the leaf will be positioned in relative to it. Uh, but I will have to have confirmation from the team before I can affirm that. All right. Is it possible to turn ArcGIS layers on or off during gameplay at runtime? It's something that we will target and that will work. Uh, we just, uh, just have a little bit of uh, extra API work to be done. So it won't probably work for beta, but it will work for beta too, uh, that we release right after, because it's one of the functionalities that will enable right after beta is, uh, is shipped. All right. How far off are feature layers? Will initial release support reading attributes? <laughs> I think uh, that's that's a good question. Uh, it's obviously it's one of the next um, one of the next layer types uh, that we'd like to be able to support within the uh, the game engine SDKs. We'd like to have this in our first production release, and our first really our first production release for this is we're looking at probably Q2 of 2021 at this stage. It's fairly early. We don't know that these are early days, so we'd like to get some feedback first on the beta before we know exactly when when we're able to deliver this for production use. Uh, but we'd like for that first release to to support uh, feature layers uh, from services and local data. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see how much progress we can make. I think at a minimum, uh, what we'd like to be able to do is at least make allow for folks to be able to work with uh, geometry and attributes themselves. Uh, there's a, a follow-on question there that will probably uh, be asked, which is about being able to support symbology. Uh, that's basically part of uh, uh, the model that Esri delivers today. And being able to deliver that information in a way that can be utilized within a game engine. And that's a little bit further out, actually, being able to distribute and utilize symbology um that's part of the uh, the arches platform so it's a it's a, a longer running effort uh it's obviously higher on our priority list uh, and we'd like to get that out as soon as possible uh, like i mentioned before uh during the presentation and, and adrian showed with the location component there are ways that developers can bring in this information today it's a little bit more of a manual lift uh, in the sense that you're going to be coding a solution to do this uh, but we'd like to formalize that uh ideally by our first production release we'll see how that goes I just wanted to add to that that our, our first goal is actually to support the feature capability of the 3D object scene layer. So part of our final release, we're definitely going to have the ability of select one of the buildings uh, and be able to get the attributes and be able to do things like recoloring depending on those attributes or hide buildings depending on those attributes. Uh, that will be our first step into supporting features. Uh, and then we'll try to consume geometry coming from a feature service. And then, as Rex mentioned, in a longer run, be able to add uh, symbology. But symbology is going to be, at the technical level, really complicated to deal between you know, the uh, game engine symbology and the uh, ArcGIS uh, symbology. All right. Does the Esri R&D Center in Zurich host any separate conferences separate specifically for 3D VR? Uh, separate, like uh, Esri-oriented conferences. I, I'm not aware of uh, yeah. not aware of a specific uh, conference or event. Um, generally, this is uh, the the products we're talking about here with the ArcGIS Maps SDK. Uh, these this is new. These are new developer products, and so are our developer summits uh, and developer events that we have as part of Esri uh, events. Uh, will uh, will include uh, discussions about uh, supporting and support for game engine uh, development. So uh, whether it's a European Developer Summit, it's our, our International Developer Summit in Palm Springs, it's uh, our developer days that, that go along with other events that we have, other Esri events. Um, uh, those, are the, those are usually the, the events in which we present and discuss, uh, present and discuss the, uh, the developer technology that, that we deliver. Uh, I'm not aware of a, of a separate event. 
Uh, but we no, can, Stefan can... from the Zurich office is actually saying that it's usually the Dev Summit in Europe, uh, but obviously it's not happening uh, in yep. person this year. So we'll have to see what happens uh, yep. this year. All right, thank you so much. And for our last question, when do you think you will be out of beta? So yeah, I think I touched on that just briefly before. Right now, uh, we're looking at uh, probably uh, the second quarter of, of 2021. Uh, but again, this is our first beta. We need to get our first beta out the door here in the next two weeks uh, and uh, evaluate uh, the first beta, um, get feedback, uh, make sure that we're making progress and that we're delivering something that's uh, that's responsible and available for, for use in production. Uh, we will have a, a second beta. Um, right now, we're, we're thinking towards the end of this year uh, with some additional uh, functionality. Uh, before we have our first uh, commercial or production release. Uh, so there's a there's another beta in the works uh, here before we get to our first production release. Uh, again, uh, a lot of this relies on uh, feedback that we get during the uh, within the beta community uh, to be able to determine uh, if what we're delivering uh, meets the needs and the requirements that, uh, that are necessary for these projects and efforts that are going on with game engines. Uh, so we're looking forward to, to working with you in the in the early adopter program and our beta program uh, further to, to determine that. All right. Thank you, Rex. And thank you, Adrian. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar intro to ArcGIS Maps SDK for Game Engines. If you have any other questions, please contact me using my email address and your follow-up email. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate it greatly if you would complete that and provide your feedback. We will be providing a recording of this presentation, which will be available within seven to 10 business days on the go.esri.com slash geodev page. On behalf of Esri and our presenters, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.